Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Garden of Eden, to the place of paradise, to the house of the Lord, St. Philip Lutheran Church here in Raleigh, North Carolina, for our service of worship and praise this Sunday morning. This marks one year to the day, to the Sunday, uh, when we last were able to gather for in-person worship. Uh, once it was called off, none of us uh, knew for how long that would be. Uh, so we are more than glad, more than excited, more than appreciative uh, to be able to gather here uh, for worship once again in person, outside, in a limited seating capacity. So let's give God a hand clap of praise. He is worthy of all of our praise. He has been so good to us. He has kept us throughout this plague and pandemic, and uh, we are so grateful and appreciative for this very moment. Today is the fourth Sunday in Lent that season of repentance and contrition, when we recall that God's word says, the sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, thou, O God, wilt not despise. And again, if my people, who are called by my name, would humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I would hear from heaven, I would forgive their sin, and I would heal their land. We are absolutely delighted that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. Uh, we are so excited that you are here. It is our hope and our prayer that our worship service this morning would be an uplift and an inspiration to you, as well as a comfort and a consolation to you in your time of need. We continue to thank you for your financial support of our ministry and mission here at St. Philip. Trust you me, it does not go unnoticed, and we appreciate you very much. Put quite simply, we would not be who we are. We could not do what we do apart from your financial generosity. So we thank you very much. You may continue to give either through the mail or via our church website, which is www.stphilip.org. That's st-philip.org. Uh, we have sign-up opportunities to assist with this 11 a.m. worship service. You can find that at the back of your bulletin or the end of your bulletin if you're online. If you would like to participate in any way, shape, or form with helping to lead this worship service, uh, we ask you to sign up on our Sign Up Genius, and we will do our best to accommodate you. All are welcome, all are invited, all are encouraged to sign up for whatever way you feel God is leading you to participate and lead this worship service. Uh, we do realize that this is the first step, uh, taking our worship outside. So we've had to uh, take out a lot of things, as you can see, and then some of which you cannot see. Um, but we want to ask you for your grace, your patience, and understanding. This is our first time doing it, so it will probably not be perfect. And indeed, we will be working on tweaks, I would imagine, in the coming weeks. Uh, we did that inside for, for, for many, many weeks. So bear with us, and remember, as Christians, we are people most fundamentally of grace. So we thank you in advance for your grace. Having said that, if we could give a Nobel Prize uh, this morning, we would give it to Don Helmer for all that he has done. Yay. Um, I don't know what you can see on your screen up there, but there's things behind that you can't see. There's a lot of technical equipment out here, cables, and all these things that I know nothing about and would be utterly lost in trying to uh, negotiate and manage. So uh, we thank our whole team, of course. But Don, we owe a special debt of gratitude to you. Thank you for being so faithful and loyal and putting in so much hard work. We appreciate you, and it is because of you and Jesus that we are outside tonight. <laughs> and so we thank both of you for that. Uh, there is a church council meeting today at 5, uh, 7 p.m. tonight. There's the social justice ministry uh, meeting where we continue with the webinar, the hidden curriculum. And with that, we now prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion as together we confess our sin in silence.
fountain of living water. Pour, Pour out, out your, your mercy, mercy over us. Our, our sin, sin is heavy, and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined, and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the Spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven, and God remembers them no more. Journey now in the way of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Our gathering hymn this morning is where cross the crowded ways of life. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And, and also, also with you. you. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Glory to God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you. pray. O oh God, rich in mercy, by the humiliation of your Son, you lifted up this fallen world and rescued us from the hopelessness of death. Lead us now into your life, that all our deeds may reflect your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, 
now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now for the reading of God's holy word. Real close. Really close. Here, you want to use this one? Yep. Well, no, it's fine. He, the cam the camera can All right, the first reading from is written in the 21st chapter of Numbers. From Mount Hor, the Israelites set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the lead land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord set poisonous serpents among them, among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, we have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. We will now read together from Psalm 107, starting with the first verse. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good, and God's mercy endures forever. Let, Let the, redeemed the redeemed of the Lord proclaim that God redeemed them from the hand of the foe. Gathering them in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were fools and took rebellious paths. Through, Through their, their sins, sins they, they were afflicted. afflicted. They loathed all manner of food and drew near to death's door. Then, then in their, their trouble, trouble they, they cried to the Lord, and, and you delivered them from their distress. You sent forth your word and healed them and rescued them from the grave. Let, Let, Let them give thanks, thanks to you, Lord, for your steadfast love and your wonderful works for all people. Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of your deeds with shouts of joy. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the second chapter of Ephesians. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were, by nature, children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. 
and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Jesus, in Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and above the is steadfast love. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and above the is The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter, beginning with the 14th verse. Glory, Glory, to, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Something I haven't said in a while. You may be seated. <laughs> As the current commercial says, can you hear me now? Well, I'm glad we caught that then and not in the middle of the sermon. Let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of today. We thank you for this Sabbath day of worship and rest. We praise you for the beauty of your creation, particularly at the beginning of spring. We thank you for the sun which shines and the birds which chirp and sing in the air. We praise you for the gift of each other, the ability to assemble, at least in a limited capacity. We thank you for all that is to come. 
as this pandemic dissipates. Bless us, continue to keep us safe, give us your wisdom. We ask now that you would speak to us once again of your great love for us and for all of humankind. We need you, Lord, and we thank you for always being there. In Jesus' name we pray. <clears throat> Let the church say amen. My sermon text for today. Thank you. you no, know, you just never know when you come outside. The wind blows, and I have a manuscript, so I brought a couple extra paper clips. But praise God for Julie Helmy that came up with some uh, weights. Man, I could take these home and do some curls with these. My sermon text for today is the first uh, lesson, the Book of Numbers, chapter twenty-one, verses four through nine. It is an interesting, fascinating story. My sermon title for today is the last three words of verse number four. On the way. On the way. The title of this book of Numbers in the Hebrew Bible, that is the Jewish Bible, is in fact not Numbers, but rather in the wilderness. The reason is obvious and due to context. The Hebrew people, the forerunners of the Israelites and the Jews, God's chosen people, have been freed from slavery in Egypt under Pharaoh and are now journeying through the barren desert wilderness of Sinai for 40 years before entering and conquering the promised land of Canaan. The title we have in our Christian Bible simply comes from the census or the numbering of the people and tribes which takes place in the opening four chapters. My personal study Bible and its introductory comments for this book says the following. Many of the traditions herein portray Israel's murmuring occasioned by the people's precarious existence in the wilderness. The people are pictured as faithless, rebellious, and blind to God's sign. I think this morning's text fits almost perfectly in such a description and therefore resonates with most of us as an accurate portrayal of human nature amid the various trials and tribulations of life. Verse 4 begins, From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, but the people became impatient on the way. As soon as I read that, the words, the phrase leapt out at me, impatient on the way. I'm on my way somewhere, but I'm growing impatient on the way. I know God has something special for me, and I'm excited about that. I look forward to that, but I'm becoming impatient on the way. I know God has brought me a mighty long way. I don't deny that. I believe that and confess it. I, I saw it for heaven's sake because I was there when He parted the waters of the Red Sea just a few years ago. It's just that I'm becoming impatient on the way. You know, 40 years in the wilderness is a long time. It's a long time to just eat manna, just to have to get water out of rocks, just to subsist and barely get by and barely survive. So I am becoming impatient on the way. I know I'm headed to my blessing. I know I'm headed towards Canaan to the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. I know it's my inheritance promised to my ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, via a covenant with God, and I thank God for all of that, but sometimes I get impatient on the way. Does anyone out here this morning know what I'm talking about? Does anybody out there this morning know what I'm talking about? You know where God has brought you from, and you feel deep down that He's leading you still. You know your inheritance is precious indeed, but you just want to be there. You just want to arrive and reach your destination. Finally stop traveling on this particular road that you have been on for so long. You're ready for a change in season, a change in scenery, ready to cross over Jordan into a new reality. In such an impatient spirit, verse 5 reveals that the people spoke against God and against Moses, saying, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. 
First of all, when you're impatient and in a miserable situation, it's only natural to blame someone else because someone else has got to be at fault, right? I don't know about you, but I'm never responsible for my own frustrating situation. It's always somebody else's fault. Someone else has always caused it. So in this case, the people blame God and blame their leader, Moses. Secondly, when we get stressed or cranky, oftentimes our murmurings or our complaints don't even make sense. Is the food here in this text miserable or is there no food at all? Which one is it? You can't have it both ways. And lastly, sometimes our sinful past looks a whole lot better than our redeemed present. One of the constant themes as the people wander through the wilderness is that they begin to yearn for the security of Egypt over the precariousness of life in the desert. They may have been oppressed in Egypt, but at least they had food. They may have been in bondage, enslaved, but at least they had drink and a home. Times may have been brutally hard, but at least there was a modicum of stability. In the desert, you may be free, but it's still the desert. Sometimes our freedom is so precarious, so fragile, we are so vulnerable that it becomes paralyzing and it renders us immobile. The turn the text takes next is rather disconcerting, to say the least. Rather than God being gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, as the psalm says and as we like to sing, verse 6 reports, Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many of the Israelites died. Okay. Looks like we're not the only ones who can get stressed and frustrated and exasperated. The anger and the wrath of God is something we don't like to talk about for obvious reasons, and yet it is a part of the biblical record. There is no avoiding or dancing around this text, my friends. God is obviously not pleased with His people's lack of faith and trust. At least this plague leads to repentance on the part of the people, no doubt achieving its desired effect, since verse 7 records, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from among us. How easy it would have been for Moses to refuse this request, to bask in his vindication and watch the downfall of all those who opposed him. Thankfully, he does no such thing, however, but Verse 7 says, So Moses prayed for the people. Moses' intercession is effective, as we see in the very next verse. The Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. Verse 9 concludes this rather bizarre, obscure Old Testament story. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. It's an interesting cure for a devastating plague. Looking at an image of that which is causing your suffering and death. That which is actually killing you. An interesting historical footnote to this text can be found in 2 Kings chapter 18. Roughly 500 years later, 500 years into the future, when the southern kingdom of Judah is undergoing a purge of idols and idolatry during the reign of a faithful and benevolent king named Hezekiah. The text reports therein, in 2 Kings chapter 18, that Hezekiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And he removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah, all of them idols, And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had burned incense to it. It was called Nehushtan. What had happened, you see, was that what was once originally from God eventually became an idol. What once had worked health and restoration of the people now inspired worship. 
what once had affected deliverance and salvation now inspired incense. What once was crucial and indeed given by God had crossed the line and become too important. And the crucial difference here, of course, is a highly nuanced and oh so subtle distinction between what is of God and from God and God. Sometimes God gives us things which are good and healthy and beneficial in and of themselves and we turn them into idols. Sometimes God gives us things which are restorative and reconciling and we begin to worship them. Sometimes God gives us things which are holy and edifying and we begin to burn incense to them. Modern science, medicine, technology are all gifts from God, but they are not God. Doctors, lawyers, teachers, nurses, social workers, public servants, pastors, all can have godly influence on lives, but they're not God. Schools, families, jobs, congregations are all of God and from God, but they are not God. It bears repeating. Our families and our jobs may be from God, but they are not God. And yet they have become for us Nehushtan, our idol at whose altar we worship. What is a gift from God in your life that has, without you even realizing, without you even critically reflecting upon it, become God? How sad and how tragic that the God-given agent of life and healing in this text that which brings wholeness and life to the people has to be destroyed generations later in a purge of idolatrous objects. John's Gospel in particular makes an interesting and perhaps obvious connection with this mosaic text from Numbers and one that is full of truth instead of idolatry. In our Gospel lesson this morning from chapter 3, Jesus Himself says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. Obviously, this lifting up refers to His crucifixion on Calvary's cross. Again, in chapter 8 of John, Jesus will say, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and I do nothing of my own authority, but speak thus as the Father has taught me. And again in chapter 12, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people unto Me. And in an ironic reversal of this Numbers text, whereupon we gaze at an image of that which is killing us, here at the brutal scene of Jesus' crucifixion, on an uplifted cross, we gaze for our healing and salvation at that which we have killed unjustly. We look fully and uncomfortably upon Him who was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and by whose stripes of laceration we are made whole. That's Isaiah 53. Our hearts are converted in a spirit of compassion and supplication when we gaze upon Him whom we have pierced, mourning as one mourns for an only child, weeping bitterly as one weeps over a firstborn. That's Zechariah 12. It cannot but move your heart to a crushing repentance and an unusual openness to this strange forgiveness of God that God offers when you soberly sing that line from the famous hymn at the cross. Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut its glories in when God the mighty Maker died for His own creature's sin. Interestingly enough, this Numbers text marks a crucial and critical turning point for the Israelites as they wander their way through the barren desert wilderness for an entire generation on their way to the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Unless you look at the context of the text, you wouldn't notice this. In the three verses preceding this text, Israel fights a battle with the Canaanites of Arad, A-R-A-D which yields mixed results. Namely, first the Canaanites defeat them, then the Israelites defeat the Canaanites. 
back and forth they go. That is the story of Israel as it wanders through the wilderness. One biblical commentator, however, notes concerning these three verses, and I quote, This passage marks a significant turning point. From here on out, the Israelites are no longer defeated by their enemy, but they march on victoriously. This story of this bronze serpent, from here on, they are no longer defeated from their enemies, but here on out, they march on victoriously. My friends, when you gaze upon Jesus Christ lifted up on the cross, suffering and paying the price for your sins and the sins of the whole world, there is a sense in which you are no longer defeated by your enemies, but you march on victoriously. When you are covered and cleansed by the Lamb's blood, when you exchange yokes with the Master such that you receive rest for your souls, you are no longer defeated by enemies, but you are marching on victoriously. When you realize that when we were still weak, Christ died for the ungodly. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for you and for me. And there is therefore now no condemnation for all those who are in Christ Jesus. You are no longer defeated by enemies, but you are marching on victoriously. When you realize if God be for us, who can be against us? It is God who justifies, who can condemn? We are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. No weapon formed against you shall ever prosper. And we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. When you realize that, you are no longer defeated and you are marching on victoriously. When you realize even when your own heart condemns you, God is greater than your heart, you are no longer defeated, but you are marching on victoriously. The Hebrew children were impatient on the way, but their breakthrough was on the way. The Israelites were impatient on the way, but their new season was on the way. The chosen people of God were impatient on the way, but the river Jordan and Canaan and milk and honey were on the way. Indeed, they were just around the corner. God's people were on their way. And then Jesus announced, I am the way and the truth and the life. God's deliverance draws near, my friends. His salvation has gone forth. That's Isaiah 51. So gaze upon the cross and live. Gaze upon the cross and cry. Gaze upon the cross and rejoice. Gaze upon the cross and be healed. Gaze upon the cross and realize the true nature of love. A love which pours itself out even unto death so that others may benefit and live. For it's at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. Your season is almost here. Your season is just around the corner. Your breakthrough is on the way. It's on the way. On the way. Amen. We sing together now our hymn of the day. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, otherwise known as at the cross. Yeah. 
Now profess, I believe believe in God the the Father Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. You may at this time write your prayer request and prayers of thanksgiving into the chat box. Good and gracious God, you sent your Son that the world might be saved through him. Inspire the witness of the church throughout the world. Empower missionaries, Bible translators, and ministries of service in your name. Bless our partners in ministry, our ELCA global partner churches, and young adults in global mission. Hear us, O God. Your Your mercy mercy is great. From east to west, your steadfast love is shown. 
nourish seas and deserts, wilderness areas and cities, give water to thirsty lands, nurture spring growth that feeds hungry creatures, bless farmers as they prepare for the growing season. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You sustained your people in the wilderness. Give courage to all who lead in times of crisis and scarce resources. Prosper the work of those who aid victims of famine and drought. Bring peace in places where scarce resources cause violence. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Your mercy endures forever. Deliver all who cry to you, especially those who are hungry or without homes. Give life in places where death seems triumphant. Give healing to those who are sick and comfort to those who mourn. Hear us, O God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. By grace we have been saved. Fill this congregation to overflowing with that grace that we show mercy to others. Nourish any in our midst who are hungry, especially children, and bless our ministries of feeding and shelter. Give us patience and courage when the way seems long. Hear us, O God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. Your Son was lifted up, that whoever believes might have eternal life. We praise You for all who have died in Christ. Bring us with all the saints into the fullness of Your promises. Hear us, O God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. Joel, you may now pray the prayer petitions. Today we lift up Steve Norris's friend who will be having open heart surgery. We lift up Don and family at the loss of his wife, Rita. Um, for Kathy Bloom's aunts, Marianne and Agnes, both recovering from cancer. And for Paul Lester's brother, Howie, struggling with overwhelming grief. For us, oh God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. As, As the, the family, family of St. Philip, we, we ask that you open our ears to hear your call for us and guide our feet in following. Help us to be good stewards of our time and treasure and to put our trust in you to provide. We ask for blessings on the life of our pastor and that your spirit guide us in relationship and ministry. We put our hope in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We now celebrate together the Lord's Supper, the Feast of Holy Communion. And now may the Lord be with you. And, and also, also with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We, we lift them, them to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is right, right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places Give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy 
Scripture tells us that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us now pray together as Jesus taught us. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is, is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily, daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus draws the whole world to Himself. Come to this meal and be fed. steadfast love at this table you gather your people into one body for the sake of the world send us in the power of your spirit that our lives bear witness to the love that has made us new in Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord Amen and now beloved receive the benediction of our Lord you are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, free to serve your neighbor. God bless you that you may be a blessing in the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen. 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 Our sending hymn this morning is in the cross of Christ I glory. Thank you. <laughs> Good to have someone catch your foibles. Yes, we invite you to drive through communion here at St. Philip in our parking lot from 1230 to 1 p.m. Please remain masked and in your cars. We look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you, Sylvia. Amen.
partners in ministry, what is our calling? Jesus asks that we love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. Jesus tells us that a second is like it. We shall love our neighbors as ourselves. We answer that call, and we go out to share the love of Christ. Thanks be to God. Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.